So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome here on stage His Excellency Dr. Zarif, Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and also His Excellency Dr. Nahavandian, Chief of Staff of the Presidency of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So, both of you, a warm welcome. <clears throat> Excellencies, allow me to raise the first question to both of you. You are here days after the release of the sanctions in the context of the nuclear agreement. So how does it change your country, maybe from a domestic point of view as well as from a foreign policy point of view? And maybe, Dr. Nahavanyan, you would like to start with the domestic consequences. Thank you very much. I think with all of the excitement in the air about uh, knowing more about Iran after some disconnection of global markets from the realities of Iran. Uh, the fact that we are seeing tens of economic delegations, business delegations coming to Iran with the same question. What after uh, this agreement? The immediate uh, result would be uh, that Iran having access to its own reserves, uh, w having in mind that Iran is one of the uh, countries with the least of debt and one of the best balances on its uh, international reserves. Iran will be able to finance more of its investment projects by its own capital, as well as uh, welcoming international markets for investing in uh, developmental projects, whether it's uh, just national or regional. And by that, I would like to emphasize that in our uh, economic vision in the new administration, we think that we have to think and act regionally. One of the main emphasis is on uh, regional development. We think that economic prosperity goes hand in hand with security, and fighting violence and extremism. And for that purpose, we have to create jobs. We have to put together our resources for development of uh, the region. The prospect, according to all studies of independent um, research centers or international organizations, the uh, GDP growth for Iranian economy just this year, 2016, and coming years will be more than average for global growth rate. It is predicted at least 5%. Uh, domestically, the five-year plan, which is going to uh, pass through our parliament in coming months, it's aiming for 8% growth rate uh, on average. So uh, there is an ambitious plan for investment. The business environment internally has uh, improved a uh, great deal. Uh, our ranking in uh, business environment has improved more than 25 uh, points. That shows that the commitment of the new administration in improving business environment has been put in place. When the new administration took office, the economy was suffering from negative 6.8% uh, in growth rate. During sanction years, Sanctions have been lifted only two days now. During those sanction years, the new administration 
managed to take the economy from negative growth rate to positive one. Last year, we experienced 3% positive growth rate. And at the same time, we were able to bring down inflation from more than 35% to 13% now. That shows the direction and the vision and the thinking of the new administration regarding the economy. We think that with the same uh, philosophy and thinking of looking for win-win solutions in our international politics and the negotiations that Dr. Zarif is responsible and he will talk about, in economic ties also, we look for win-win solutions. Thank you. That was an excellent handover to Dr. Zarif. Well, thank you very much and a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I think uh, the two messages, one global and one regional. Global message is that diplomacy works. Uh, and that is a very welcome mes message that all of us should uh, entertain seriously when it comes to other issues. Uh, diplomacy requires patience. Uh, it requires abandoning uh, the will to impose, the will to coerce, and replacing it with a will to negotiate and a will to reach mutually acceptable solutions. And I think what we did over the past two years, uh, two and a half years particularly, was to try to see how best we could achieve our objectives without necessarily harming uh, the interests and objectives and concerns uh, of uh, our negotiating partners. And I think we achieved that. I think the deal is not a perfect deal. No deal is ever perfect. But it deals with our requirements, that is, removal of sanctions, and at the same time, respecting our right to have our nuclear program for peaceful purposes, because our nuclear program was always for peaceful purposes. But now we are prepared to show even greater uh, transparency in order for the international community to know what we already know, that our program is nothing but peaceful. Uh, and at the same time, sanctions will be removed, and Iran uh, will provide the opportunities for both uh, economic interests uh, in the region and globally to engage. And I think that would be a good message for everybody. So both in terms of the political aspect as well as the economic aspect globally, it's a win-win situation, and it's a win for us, uh, for all. Regionally, I think it sends a message that if we can resolve something that everybody thought was impossible to resolve with countries who were, uh, obviously at least Iran and the United States, were hostile for at least 37 years, then there is no impediment in resolving regional issues between countries, countries and peoples who call themselves each other brothers and sisters, and who are bound by a common religion, common faith, common history, common culture, common uh, values, uh, which makes it possible for all of us to work together to address a very serious challenge in our region, and that is the challenge of extremism. Extremism is not a threat against any particular nation. It's not a challenge, it's not a concern that could be contained within a particular geography. It cannot even be contained within our region. It has already spread all across the world. You see the indications from San Bernardino to Paris, to Madrid, to Moscow, to Islamabad, to Istanbul, anywhere you, you just find the name, Sydney, uh, Canada, whatever name you can find on the map, extremism has been able to spread and infiltrate in that part of the world. And it's a threat against every single one of us in this region. And if we could resolve a seemingly impossible problem of Iran's nuclear ambitions, where somebody was calling it a nuclear weapons program, and we were calling it our right to develop nuclear technology for peaceful purposes, if we could resolve that diametrically opposed uh, contentions uh, that were being made and had been basically entrenched for uh, over 12 years, how can we not resolve small differences that exist in our region. And I think that should be a message. I'm sorry that some of our neighbors have found that a threat. I'm sorry that some of our neighbors reacted to the nuclear negotiations and to the achievements that we had with an attempt to kill it, with an attempt to torpedo it, and now with an attempt to provoke 
uh, a crisis in our region. I don't see why. I believe that we need to work for a resolution of all the misunderstandings and then work together for a better future. And I think that should be the message of the nuclear deal. So thank you to both of you. And let me build on this what Dr. Zarif just said. So in 2014, when President Rouhani was here in Davos exactly on this stage, he mentioned Iran's readiness to end the standoff against the West. And given the recent discussions, uh, rocket launches, uh, discussions of even sanctions, so my question is how realistic is this readiness? And what is your today's message to the international community? Well, we showed over the past two and a half years that Iran was serious. Over the past six months, we showed that we could even expedite measures that we were supposed to take. Nobody expected Iran to finish implementing what we implemented in less than six months. Everybody was hoping uh, or waiting for April or May before we, uh, we would have the implementation day. Now we had the implementation day on Saturday. The, the IAEA verified that Iran had implemented every single bit of its commitments under the JCPOA or the nuclear deal. So it showed that we can, in fact, do it. Reaching an understanding does not mean one side giving up or submitting or surrendering. Iran's defense program is outside the parameters of this deal, and Iran spends a fraction of some of our neighbors in the region on defense. Our defense budget, particularly our spending on military hardware, is less than a tenth of what Saudi Arabia spends on military hardware. And I find it rather bizarre that the United States expresses concern over Iranian missile program, which are defensive, does not, do not violate any current international regulation. Maybe when 1921, 1929 Security Council Resolution 1929 was in effect, somebody could have argued, but today with 2231 in effect, nobody can argue that Iran's defense program, missile program, has violates anything. We are entitled to our defense. We are spending a fraction of what our very smaller neighbors spend on defense. So what's all this fuss about? I, I can't understand. Of course, there are domestic constituencies in the United States who were against this deal to begin with, who did everything to kill this deal to begin with. And unfortunately, they were supported by the financing that came from region, uh, our region, by the political pressures that came from our region. But, but let bygones be bygones. Let's start from now. There is no threat coming from Iran against any of its neighbors. No threat has come from Iran against any of its neighbors for over 250 years. We did not invade anybody, although we are the, one of the biggest or the biggest country in the region. We never invaded any of our neighbors, but we defend ourselves. And we are entitled to the means of our defense. And we will not abandon those, but we are prepared to engage in confidence-building measures with all our neighbors. I wrote an op-ed in, in the New York Times, and before that, I wrote that same op-ed in Ashraf al Ausad in an Arabic paper, calling for a regional dialogue forum where we could raise our concerns to, towards each other, including concerns over security and defense. We are prepared for that because we have nothing to hide. In fact, if people come and start to come and look at our expenditure and compare it with the expenditure of others in the region, they'll see that you need to help us with, uh, with that a bit because we're not spending even a fraction of what others are. So thank you very much for this. And you know, top of mind of the international community is, of course, the tensions between your country and Saudi Arabia. So, and there's a little bit of worry that we see a more destabilization of the Middle East. So my direct question, allow me this, Foreign Minister, um, is a war even possible? War? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, uh, I think uh, our Saudi neighbors need to realize that confrontation is in the interest of nobody. Unfortunately, since, I mean, they, uh, uh, I, I, we don't have any Saudi on the stage, so I do not want to uh, go to the judge by myself. I'll come back winner. But, but I just want to just make a point. Since the agreement in Geneva in 2013, our Saudi neighbors have been panicking. 
there is no reason to panic, our friends. Iran is there to work with you. Iran does not want to exclude anybody from this region. There is no need to engage in a confrontation. Iran has been provoked time and again. Two kids, two Iranian kids were molested in Jeddah airport. I was asked to bro break diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia. I refused. The unfortunate incident at the Saudi embassy has been condemned by everybody from the president to leader today to every other person uh, belonging to every political inclination and grouping in Iran. So this was an act that we are not proud of. It was an act against our security, our sovereignty, and we are prosecuting the people who committed that horrendous act. We have taken measures in order to protect Saudis. We took measures in order to protect Saudi diplomats a couple of hours after that, that very unfortunate, regrettable incident occurred. Unfortunately, our Saudi neighbors were looking for an excuse to break diplomatic relations, and so they did. But I do not believe that anybody has any interest in exacerbating tension, in increasing the level of hostility. In fact, we should try our best, as Iran has done, to exercise self-restraint and to come to our senses and engage in serious discussions. Iran has always been ready for that. Iran is ready for that now. We, we believe that the interest of our region will be best served by cooperation against our common threat, our common enemy, which is extremism, which is ISIS and Daesh and Nusra and others who are ravaging our entire region and ravaging the world as a result. So thank you. Dr. Navani and a more economic question. So it was a very fruitful uh, visit of the President Rouhani 2014. He also mentioned here on stage that in a decade or so, Iran will be among the top 10 economies. You are strong even today, certainly, but my question is, what is your strategy and your way towards this? Uh, Iran is already 18th with regard to uh, its GDP by uh, purchasing power parity measures. Um, given the fact that Iran has the potential uh, to come out of this uh, recession after lift of sanctions uh, with a rate of uh, average 8% uh, growth rate, it is feasible to get to that point. Uh, being mindful of the fact that uh, there are so many um, world uh, companies, global companies, who have expressed interest uh, in uh, energy sector in Iran, in ICT, in uh, transit uh, routes, be it uh, railway or uh, roads or airways. Uh, the big potential uh, in Iranian economy, which has been coined by some analysts as uh, the most promising emerging market in coming decade, uh, gives uh, a lot of evidence that that uh, goal is achievable. Of course, uh, uh, there are things to be done for that, and uh, the administration is uh, uh, mindful of the fact that the business environment has to improve a great deal, and we have already started that work. Um, our FIPA Act, uh, Foreign Investment Protection Act is one of the most progressive uh, in the region uh, and 100% uh, share in, uh, by foreign companies in different areas uh, is possible. Our privatization uh, program has started already uh, many years ago. Uh, now the private sector in Iran is strong enough to be a partner for foreign companies. Um, so I think with the improvement that we had in our uh, monetary policy, which proved to be uh, successful with regards to the inflation rate, uh, that uh, goal of uh, uh, 
uh, growth rate in GDP is achievable. Thank you, Dr. Navanyan. I think the investors or potential investors are also interested in some domestic policy questions. You have scheduled parliamentarian elections uh, soon. And my question is, what do you think, how will the nuclear agreement and the signing affect these elections? Or more to the point, will it strengthen the moderate camp in your country? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, the nuclear deal and the achievement uh, was perceived by Iranian nation as a national victory, uh, not a uh, political victory by this faction or that faction. And if uh, you look at public opinion, uh, the uh, approval of what was done uh, runs more than 80%. So that shows that uh, this issue uh, is not a divisive issue. It actually helped the unity in the nation. And we think that uh, the uh, willingness and participation in the election overall will be greater than before. Uh, Given the fact that uh, after Islamic Revolution, we have had this uh, uh, democratic practice in our elections, um, of course, uh, we have had ups and downs. We have uh, difference of opinion on how to run elections. And that is actually uh, the thing which uh, uh, increases the heat for election and the particip participation goes up. <clears throat> but uh, I don't uh, see uh, the nuclear deal as a divisive element. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe, again, a foreign policy question. Dr. Zarif, here in Davos is also the special envoy of the UN for Syria, Stefan de Mistura. And he will call on the Syria talks next week in Geneva. You mentioned recently that uh, Iran is still remain committed to solve this proxy war. So my question is, what is a concrete proposal maybe for the incoming week? What can the global community expect out of these talks? But I think all of us need to recognize, and, I, and that may be a, a truism to most of you here, but it requires some doing to have it accepted in the region, that there is no military solution to the crisis in Syria. I think that's a major, major issue for understanding, for accepting by all sides that there won't be a military solution. Uh, we need a political solution. Iran was determined from the very beginning to help a political solution. Unfortunately, there were preconditions. Some wanted the outcome of a political process to be determined before the political process started. And that would make a negotiation absolutely impossible. You cannot go to the negotiating room telling the negotiating parties, this is what you're supposed to do at the end of your negotiations. Who would negotiate them? So we said that we need a political process in which there is a national unity government. There are possibilities for free and fair elections. But at the same time, there are possibilities for constitutional reform so that the winner is not a situation where the winner takes all. That the winner does not take all and the losers don't lose everything. I think that's a formula that can, in fact, resolve the Syrian question, provide confidence to people that through that, no matter who wins the election, everybody will have a stake, a share in the future of Syria. That has been the proposal that I made two years ago, a four-point plan, ceasefire, national unity government, constitutional reform, elections based on the new constitution. I believe that's the basic framework that, as Secretary Kerry says, lies at the foundations of the new Security Council resolution. So we are prepared, we are determined to assist in this process. As I told Stefan Dimistura when he was in Tehran a week ago, we are determined 
to provide every contribution and encouragement that we can in order to bring people to the negotiating table. I think what is necessary is to make sure that those who believe that there is a military solution are also brought to their senses and brought to the negotiating table. Thank you. My last question, because of the time, Dr. Navanian, President Rouhani is scheduled to meet the Pope in Rome, uh, I think mid of next week. I think that's a strong statement of interfaith dialogue and understanding. So from your point of view, what should be really on the top of the agenda of this kind of exchange and discussion? We think that <clears throat> uh, religions of the world uh, can provide the best resource for fighting violence and extremism. We think that uh, the idea of WAVE, uh, which was uh, approved by uh, General Assembly of UN by consensus, which was proposed by President Rouhani, can be discussed uh, between uh, religious leaders. And uh, if we can come up with the idea of uh, friendship, human values, uh, to fight uh, a negative uh, uh, abuse of religion for violence, uh, that uh, would help the peace in the world. So, Excellencies, thank you to both of you. And Dr. Navanyan mentioned the technology approach of Iran. And given the time, you were as precise as the Swiss are in time. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. We value your feedback. Please share your comments on the session via our top link session page on the app. Thank you once again.